I uh, want to welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see so many faces, even if it is through Zoom. Uh, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. As always, I want to thank the CoLab staff and uh, video production and marketing for helping to make uh, this series possible. This is our first Great Books mini lecture for the fall. We have a couple more coming up, uh, and then we'll have three in the spring, and we certainly hope you'll join us whether it's through Zoom here again, or, or maybe someday we'll be back face-to-face -face in our home uh, in the CoLab. Uh, my name is Michael Carriger, and along with Maureen Fitzpatrick, um, we are sort of hosting and organizing this year's series, and we are uh, grateful uh, to have Luz Alvarez with us today uh, to talk on what is a truly a great book. Uh, Luz is originally from Puebla, Mexico, and she holds uh, a bachelor's degree in business, but it, it really wasn't until she came to the University of Kansas that she discovered uh, what she said is her true vocation, which is that of an educator. Uh, she earned an MA in Spanish literature and Latin American studies at KU, and she is currently a professor of foreign language here at JCCC, um, where she's taught for 25 years. I think, if I remember right, she just received her 25 year service pin uh, a week or so ago. Uh, and she currently teaches all levels of Spanish here at the college. She's co-chair of the foreign language department. Uh, she's the Spanish club advisor. Uh, she's been a leader for several of the international trips that the college sponsors uh, to Spanish speaking countries. Uh, she organizes the Spanish immersion retreat. Uh, she's actively involved in the uh, college book talk series. Uh, I know that she's involved in other um, <laughs> uh, endeavors because I see her pop up all over campus and uh, she's just an integral part of, of this campus community. Uh, she also uh, is a facilitator of the Spanish language book club in the metropolitan area, uh, which I, I want to find out more about at some point. Uh, her hobbies include reading, of course, we're going to find that out, uh, but, but certainly travel and uh, travel is very important to her both domestic and international travel. She loves to explore the world more as a traveler than a tourist. And uh, her latest passion is to join the Camino de Santiago in the Northern part of Spain and to take all of those days to walk and contemplate nature and to be with all of those other pilgrims, which is one of those great world journeys that uh, many of us have read about and dreamed about. Uh, she loves yoga and Zumba uh, that helps keep her moving, as she says. And for today's presentation, uh, Professor Alvarez has chosen Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Uh, of the book, she says this. I want students to consider reading world literature, and this is a perfect book to introduce the history and the magic of Colombia, but also of all of Latin America. We are the neighbors south of the border and geographically we are closer than other continents, but somehow there are so many things we don't know about each other. Literature can be a bridge to connect. This book and this author have brought together many people of Latin America because millions read the book and through it, we can continue that connection. We learn Spanish. Uh, when you learn Spanish, you cannot only communicate with Spanish speaking people in your family, but business and work. And you can also travel to more than 20 countries to communicate with their people. And that is truly amazing. Um, and that is, and I think it's a testament to um, Luz's purpose as an educator and, and certainly to the glory of this book. Um, we will be running a pretty close clock today. Uh, many of us have a one o'clock uh, responsibility. So somewhere maybe about 1235, 1240, We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can wrap it up and maybe take a few questions before we have to head out. But it is my pleasure, uh, friends, Luz Alvarez. Thank you very much, Michael, for the nice introduction. And uh, welcome everybody uh, for this talk. Uh, really, I really, I feel really appreciated that I was asked to present one of these great books, um, for, uh, especially a book that has a lot of relevance to me. And when I thought of all the books that I have read, I really wanted to stay with Latin American uh, books that has, have been translated into English. And um, more than anything, 100 Years of Solitude came to the top of the list. 
It is original, exuberant, universal, and it actually presents all the dimensions of the human experience, but it's much more. Um, and also, like uh, Michael said, it's a really nice way for me to turn the lens to the neighbors of the South and the fantastic storytelling. Reading, reading this book, and I have read it probably four or five times, allow me to feel part of the oral tradition that permeated my family and the family of other people while growing up in Mexico. But keep in mind that uh, 100 years of solitude is universal. Uh, let me share you a, a little personal anecdote and what it meant uh, when I read 100 Years of Solitude. I remember in the, in the Hispanic tradition, in the Latin American tradition, there is an, uh, a very, a very well set, set custom of um, after a meal on Sunday afternoons, there is what we call sobremesa. And that means you're gonna stay after the meal and just be chatting for the, the rest of the evening, three or four hours, being chatting with your family, just to check in and let everybody know what, you, you, what you've been doing. So I really remember when my, my, I was with my mom's family. I had an uncle in his fifties who always used to tell all the family about this character that he knew when he was a child. And this was a character uh, in a very tropical area of my hometown, um, of the state where I am from. And so for, for years, we just sat down and listened to the story of uh, Margarito Flores, was the name of the character. And um, he, we listened and listened, and he always added more details and more details. And we were fascinated by the stories. For example, he told us that one time um, this character had been in the, in the Mexican Revolution. He was fighting against the government. And at some point, he was made a prisoner of war, and he was taken into a cell. And he had a dog, a little dog that actually the dog had to remain outside on the other side, on the, uh, on the other side of the wall. And there was a little window. And through that window, the dog was barking all the time because he was missing, uh, he was missing Margarito. And little he knew, one day he sees that the dog is right in the cell to rescue him. Because what he did, the dog, began to dig, <laughs> began to dig a tunnel to go all the way from one side to the other. And so that way the dog saved Margarito and he went on there and he just, uh, you know, he was rescued. And then um, there was another story when the Margarito was really uh, in love with the girl, with the most beautiful girl of the town. And to, to demonstrate how manly he was at the fair, at the town fair, he rode a bull and he kept, he, hold, he held the horns of the bull and the, the bull was bucking and jumping and trying to get him out. And he didn't, he didn't surrender. He just kept, he held onto the horns and the, and, and the bull just jumped out of the ring, the bull ring, and he kept on the bull and the bull kept on running and he did and one afternoon become, uh, became a day and then weeks and then months where he wouldn't surrender. People just knew he was going around and he would get fruits out of the, out of, out of the trees to feed himself. At the end, finally, when the bull got tired after one year of wandering, he, the bull got tired, he went back to, I mean, the bull went back to town and went, Margarito went to say hello to the girlfriend. Everybody was praying for him because they thought that was an anniversary of his death. So, you know, all these stories of fantasy and hyperbole, we were used to listen to them and we would rejoice and we didn't care that we heard the story one and twice and three times, um, you know, all the time because then when I read 
then when I read 100 Years of, of Solitude and I heard the voice of the narrator, to me, it was kind of validating my own history. It was like it reinforced my identity, first as a Mexican and then as a, as, as a Latin American. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it was a way of, okay, so it's not only my crazy family believing these stories of, you know, these adventures, but actually not only them, but a whole, you know, another country, some more writers look at life and they believe what can be completely illogical and out of real, reality, the reality that we have. Um, so today I'm going to share a little aspects, just a few aspects of this masterpiece, um, because actually it was the masterpiece of Latin American literature, and as you said, of a Spanish literature of the 20th century, okay? Um, and put Latin America in the literary map for years to come. And then I just have to say, we can only barely scratch the surface of this book. There is not enough time to say, but I want to tell you about the book anyway. So um, the purpose of this talk, I wanna tell you a little bit about an overview of the author of Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh -huh, the, from Colombia. And then I wanna give you a brief overview of the novel I want to mention some of the most important literary techniques. And at the end, I want to say how uh, the impact that he has had in Latin America and, and the world. So um, to begin with, I'm gonna share my, a, a picture of the author. Um, so Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and we're gonna call him Gabo as he preferred, was born in Colombia in Aracataca. Just listen to the sound of the, of the city, Aracataca, uh, very melodic. Uh, it's fun to say that name. And um, in Colombia in 1927 or 28, nobody knew for sure, he said, and it didn't really matter. There he lived with, with his grandfather and grandmother until the age of eight. And this town was the main inspiration for Macondo, which is the village, is the town where the, all the events in 100 years of solitude happened. Um, then he continued with his formal education and moved to bigger places where he discovered his love for writing and writing. In Barranquilla, Colombia, he began his journalism career and worked for Colombia and later in different countries. He began to write articles, short stories, and even poems. He tried poetry until one teacher said, no, you need to stick to narration and to short stories, leave the poetry for another time. Then later in Barranquilla, Colombia, he joined a writing circle with other friends. They were known as the group of Barranquilla, where they read the works of Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and William Faulkner. But he was also influenced, influenced by many other writers from Mexico, Cuba, Guatemala, like Rulfo. Maybe you've heard of that, but I wanted to give you some names that you might know. So his writing received the recognition from the beginning. And also he lived in many, pa in many parts of the world for his writing career. Outside of Colombia, he resided for extended periods of time in Cuba and Mexico, and he eventually died in Mexico. In Cuba, he became a good friend of Fidel Castro. He was very sympathetic with the Cuban revolution. In fact, when, when he became famous, he founded a cinema school in the capital of Cuba. He was a leftist, but that's not a, su a surprise because in Latin America, most serious intellectuals and writers are going to tend to, towards the left because they want to expose the plights and difficulty of uh, colonization, imperialism, 
working conditions for the industrial workers and farmers, exploitation of the natural resources, and the, the huge inequality that we have to, um, that we suffer in Latin America. So it's not, it's not a, a surprise that you might call, well, he never defined his political, uh, his political affiliation, but you know, most of, more of them are leftist. He, he was very good friends with Fidel Castro and they claimed that it was more for their love to literature than for their political views. Um, when you read his descriptions and create the mental images of your mind, you can easily understand why also cinematography was another interest uh, for Garcia Marquez. And then he collaborated with other directors um, who were interested in make films out of her books and short stories. And maybe you are familiar with, with, a, with a movie that was made out of one of his novels, uh, El Amor en los Tiempos del Cólera, or The Love or Love in the Times of Cholera. And that was a film that was made here um, in the US uh, with, um, no, no, excuse me, in Cartagena. But um, I just wanted to say, I just got confused with the reference to that book in, a, in another American movie. But uh, so that is to show you how his lit literature transcended many, many borders. Now, if we want to talk about 100 years of solitude, the, the book has sold millions of copies in more than 30 languages, translated into more than 30 languages and is, is really a masterpiece. The book was written in Mexico and it was written in 1965. Um, he loved anecdotes about his life and he said that um, he, was, he was driving with his family, his wife, Mercedes, and two children. They were driving down to the beach from Mexico City to the beach when suddenly midway, he was like, no, I need to go back and write my novel. There is no way that I can go with you. So they returned, he returned and he told his wife that he was going to write the, uh, the story, these hundred years of solitude. And he claimed that to him, he already had everything in his head and all he needed to do, he was to sit in front of the typewriter and just write it. And um, he, it took him 18 months to write it, um, but they were 18 months of very, a very disciplined, um, you know, writing routine. Um, he completely let his wife taking care of everything, and he just dedicated himself to write it. To write it, the wife had, you know, had to do everything. She needed to go to the pawn shop. Uh, she needed to sell some of their possessions because he was sure that he needed to finish that writing. Um, he was already a, a writer of uh, recognition. He was in his 40s. Uh, and so he had already written things. His talent was recognized, um, you know, long ago. But at that time, he just wanted to read this novel. Um, he published it. Um, well, he finished it in 1966, and he sent it to the publisher in, uh, in Buenos Aires. He claims that he really didn't have the money to send it all the hundreds of pages of the, of the manuscript. So he had to divide, when he heard the price of the package, he had to divide the novel in two and send the first parcel uh, with the money they had. And then they had to go and, and you know, go to the pound shop and get some more money to send the second. Uh, but from the beginning in 1967, um, it sold 8,000 copies and they were sold in, in a week. Okay, I don't remember this. I was just a little girl back then. I, I, hadn't dis I, I really hadn't discovered uh, Garcia Marquez. In 1970, he... Um, the English uh, version was published and it became an instant uh, bestseller 
and was named one of the best books of the year. Okay, um, one writer says that the novel came off the press in Buenos Aires in 67, two days before Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band was released. And the response that it had in Latin America was very similar to the Beatlemania because people were just um, had, um, you know, full of crowds, cameras, exclamation points, and a sense that something new was cooking. And um, so that's, that's the, the, the history of the book. Now, let me just go over the, uh, to share the next one. Okay, so we, okay, hold on, share, and then I'm gonna go to the next slide. Okay, so here we have a rendition of what people, the images that he created and uh, people have seen as part of the, as part of the novel, okay? Uh, so basically, if we want to summarize what happened, it is the story of the people of Macondo, a small town in the Caribbean region in Colombia. Keep in mind that it's Caribbean. So we have the weather, the uh, tropical influence, all the all these cultures that have to do with in the indigenous traditions, the folklore of the African, the Africans, and then uh, Spanish settlers. So we have all of these uh, mixed in what is the the Caribbean region in Colombia and in Latin America. But um, so there were, there were young people who were traveling, came back from, uh, well, well, came from the mountains and they were looking for a new place to settle. So we had the young couple, Jose Arcadio Buendia is the guy and his wife, Ursula Iguaran, with some follow, followers that came from the mountains and found a place to settle. They also carry their first born son, Aureliano Buendia, who later became a very important character in the novel. So it narrates the lives of the children from the, found, from the founders of the town to the final Buendia child over 100 years and seven generations later, the town is destroyed and the family finally uh, dies. And um, Macondo is a town that he recreated from the memories of his childhood. And so um, I, want to, I want you to hear the first, the first uh, paragraph that is, is, um, has been immortalized and is emblematic of the, uh, of what, uh, of the genius of um, Garcia Marquez. Okay, Michael, if you please do it. I wanted somebody without an accent to read this. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of 20 adobe houses built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were white and enormous like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lack names, and in order to indicate them, it was necessary to point. Thank you, Michael. So, um, you know, if you notice in this paragraph, it is a genius how he has encapsulated present, future, and the past in one instant. We learned about Colonel Aureliano, who is about to die. So we hear about a military, a military life. But then when he remembers his past, we are transported uh, to the innocence of, of the childhood when he discovered the eyes. So we have all of this time encapsulated in one sentence. And, and then you, you start with the, with the history of Macondo. Um, so this is a, a phrase that has been immortalized and is uh, you know, it represents what he's done with literature. So um, 
here we have the family tree. So along with Macondo, it is the story of seven generations of the family, Buendia, the Buendia family. And as you can see in this um, family tree, what is weird, you know, what is weird about this and it will make you go crazy is that the children of the children of the children and the women in the family, they all have similar names. You know, that's a tradition that we have in Latin America. And here too, right? You call somebody, you know, Peter the second, Peter the third in the same family. But when you are reading the, the, uh, the doings of this family, it doesn't help to have a lot of the characters uh, having the same name. And also the girls beginning with Amaranta and Ursula Amaranta or Remedios and Remedios called Meme, etc. So uh, these, uh, in this family tree, we see a lot of what is, they called marriage relationship or illegal relationship. Because in this novel, you see all the virtues and the faults of all family members. Um, we have the patriarca, Jose Arcadio Buendia, who traveled with, with those young people and uh, founded and founded the town. But when they came, uh, when uh, Jose Arcadio Buendia and his wife Ursula Iguaran came with, um, came, they had a huge baggage of guilt and shame. And that was because back in the place where they were from, Jose Arcadio killed a man. And he had to kill this man because Actually, they were cousins. The, the husband and wife were cousins. And there had been a legend in the family that even before that, when other people were in an incestuous relationship, they had a baby and the baby was born with the tail of a pig. And Ursula was very afraid that that was going to be uh, the, future, uh, the future baby. So she secured herself with um, something very, hmm, how can I say? Well, she secured with, uh, herself and didn't allow Jose Arcadio to have intercourse with her. Um, and so when Ar Jose Arcadio was made fun of by his friend after a, a cock fight in, the in another town, he told him that he wasn't man enough. And his, you know, his virility couldn't be questioned. So he killed him, he went home, and he told Ursula that he didn't care if they had iguanas as children because he had to be re revindicated as a man. So um, everything began. So they had children. And in this family, a lot of times in the generations, they are tempted to be attracted or to have relations with the people in the family. Um, so in these generations, we see a lot of, uh, if you wanna call them all the sins that we know, we have all the, you know, lust, gluttony, pride, greed. This is a very human novel. And so, it is evident that, you know, this is a microcosm. Ma Macondo is a microcosm. They first call it of, of Latin America, but it's actually very universal. And then we also see that the town at the beginning is very isolated. They, uh, they, 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 there, is no, there is no need for a government institution, for a religious institution. The family organized. Uh, the families organized themselves. Jose Arcadio is, um, is kind of like the leader of the, of the town. And um, so everything is going okay. I mean, I'm just telling you, I'm scratching a little bit of the surface. But then uh, there is this, uh, eventually there has to be some kind of interaction with external forces. And many things happened where 
people come into the town and the inhabitants of the town, the people in the family, they have to go out. So with this interaction, then we begin with um, a lot of conflicts, um, you know, civil wars, personal interest, um, you know, the intervention of government and religion, okay? And this culminates um, with the, with an American company that brings a banana plantation to the town. So we have voracious capitalism. The company <laughs> takes over the town and brings some progress, but with that, there is also the disadvantages to, um, to the workers because, you know, this is capitalism. So the, the, all the benefits were for the owners of the banana plantation, and then there were the workers from the town who always were, you know, with poor conditions, they have and have not. And that came with a strike. Finally, they want better conditions. And then uh, the, the government at that time, they sent the army and there is a massacre that one of the, one of the children of the family always live with that over and over, he replayed that one of, so one of the survivors, okay? And so um, at the same time as you, we can see the vulnerability of, uh, of all these people, we, can, we also see a lot of uh, good traits in the family, like hard work, intuition, uh, resilience, in, uh, inquisitive minds and persistence. But all the characters are afflicted with, not, with a lot of nostalgia and a sense of isolation and loneliness, okay? So basically that is the, in a, in a, really in a nutshell. But I wanna say that what makes this very fun is all the humor and all the hyperbole that he puts in all the events. And why is that? Well, basically it's because uh, he is the master of what we called magical realism. And this is a tendency of the writers in Latin America in the 60s and 70s, when they mixed everyday events of a story, but they added the superstition, they added the supernatural, the legends and the myths that they grew up with, okay? So for Garcia Marquez, he always claimed that it was only natural that, that, that he could mix these two situations because growing up with grandfather, he got all the facts. He got, he got the history of the region. His grandfather was also, um, he was in the army and he was in the civil war. So he knew everything about what the, the historical facts, if you may. And also in the house, there were all the, all the women in the family. And these women uh, believed in supernatural. They believed that there were ghosts around the house. They believed in superstition and legends and nothing was surprising to them. Miracles happen. And it's more scary. This is scarier when you get an influence from the external world that brings you I don't know, some, a telescope or maybe a radio and you don't know what it is, what it is, where it comes from than to see that somebody is ascended into heaven. So this is one of the, one of the most remarkable parts of, the, of magical, that's a, a sample of magical realism that, um, that, we can, that we can see in the book. There are many examples, but you know, here I'm, I'm gonna give you one and Michael is gonna read uh, a little bit of that. Keep in mind, this is a character that was so beautiful, incredibly beautiful, that he, that he really was from another world. Her beauty was so intense that there was no way that she could live in our world. Men died for her. They didn't care what, uh, what they did. They just died for her because they fell in love and they couldn't stop loving her. And her herself, she was in her 20s and she didn't care about anything. She just didn't care. She didn't wear clothes. She was around the house naked. She couldn't understand what men saw in her. They didn't understand. She didn't understand why 
um, they died for her. And so it, it, this, this, she was just too much for this world. So she was living with a sister-in-law and the sister-in-law was a, a very nice woman. So one day she says, okay, well, help me to fold the sheets uh, that are drying in the sun. And just suddenly, like Jesus, she ascended into heaven with the sheets. And Michael, will you read that paragraph? Fernanda felt a delicate wind of light pull the sheets out of her hands and open them wide. Amarantha felt a mysterious trembling in the lace of her petticoats, and she tried to grasp the sheet so she wouldn't fall down at the instant in which Remedios the Beauty began to rise. Fernanda left the sheets to the mercy of the light as she watched Remedios the Beauty waving goodbye in the midst of flapping sheets that rose up with her, and they were lost forever with her in the upper atmosphere where not even the highest flying birds of memory could reach her. Thank you, thank you. And see, it is so poetic, it, you know, even has some kind of lyricism in it, uh, you know, the way that he describes his ascension. And for Fernanda, the sister-in-law, there wasn't any surprise, you know, that she just waved goodbye. It wasn't surprising, but she was really mad that she, can, that she had taken the sheets with her. Her new sheets had gone into heaven and she never saw the sheets. So, you know, that is, that is just incredible. You just have to believe that those things, um, that those things happened. And um, uh, Gabo always says that a writer can try anything as long as he makes it believable. So uh, he claimed that another uh, technique he used was, um, was to use a specificity, a specificity, <laughs> I cannot pronounce it now, a specificity, uh, to, um, for, uh, as a technique, because he really said that, well, if I just tell you 200 elephants passed by, you won't believe me. But if I told you 232 elephants plus seven baby elephants went by, then you tend more to believe. So these, this uh, thing about being specific, I'm just gonna say that specific uh, really helped him to, um, to, uh, to tell the story. So um, when he said that the Colonel Aureliano, um, instead of saying he fought uh, some, in some wars, he makes it very specific that it was 32 wars and he lost all of them. And that is something that we hear over and over in the in the uh, in the story, okay. Another very very uh, remar remarkable and memorable memor memorable moment in the novel is um, is one when he claims that with his grandmother one day he heard that there was an electrician and that electrician um, whenever he came to the house he brought there were some butterflies. So when he put this electrician in the novel, he changed that and he said, well, the electrician was a mechanic who worked in the banana plantation. And when he came to the house, there were yellow butterflies, unspecific yellow butterflies that were around him. So everywhere he went, he, he really, um, uh, you know, he, everybody knew that he was coming because they, you would see a yellow butter, butterfly. And the yellow butterflies became emblematic of Garcia Marquez. And now, so, you know, I, could, I couldn't tell you anymore because we are out of time, but also I just wanna talk a little bit about the influence and the impact. And I learned that <clears throat> Garcia, um, that here, when he came to the United States and he worked a little bit here, he was already famous. And he had a lot of influence uh, in Toni Morrison. And when she read uh, 100 Years of Solitude and having that experience uh, with you know, the, the, the life uh, interacting with the dead people, she felt like Garcia Marquez had given her permission to write 
For example, she said that she mentions the song of Solomon because that was something that she became very familiar when she was growing up to see the, the uh, you know, ghosts and people and in that interaction with the dead people. And also um, another person that was very uh, influenced by him was uh, Salman Rochi, the British, Indian British writer. He also thought that uh, when he thought of India and Pakistan, um, it was pretty much and very close to his experiences, well, in Latin America, or the experiences of Gabo had in Latin America. So, um, you know, with these, you can see um, how, in, how important this work is uh, for Latin American people, and also for, you know, for the entire world, and having a different experience with um, what the fantastic is. And finally, if I have a couple of minutes, I want to play, um, I want to play the funeral, I mean, just a little clip of the funeral that he received in Mexico City in 2014 when he died. Okay, um, hopefully this will give you an idea of how really loved he was in Mexico. You know, I haven't seen anybody, any intellectual or writer <clears throat> in another place where he is so revered and so loved and people just poor to say goodbye to him. And, you know, just to let you know, it just felt like a big loss. Personally, it was like if I had lost my uncle all over again, you know, feeling like that sense of, I am an orphan because I don't have anybody who tell me the stories. So I will read his stories over and over again, and I hope that you can do it too. And I don't know if anybody has any questions, any comment, a little bit of experience um, that this Garcia Marquez or the novel has, I will, you know, we only have a few minutes. We probably do have time for maybe one or two if somebody has one. Feel free to just jump right in. Well, okay. I'll, ask, I'll ask one really quickly. You know, quite often when we talk about um, novels, especially that we've read at different points in our life, they sort of mean something different to us as we as we change. Has this been a book that you've 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 mentioned that you've read it several times? Do you find yourself sort of changing the way you see the novel or does it mean something different to you than oh, it did maybe the first time? Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, Michael, because every time that you read this, you discover new things that you probably didn't discover in your previous reading. So <clears throat> with, with life experience, it makes, um, you know, a more sense to you. So, you know, when you look at relationships between the characters, um, you know, it has a different, uh, a different significance. So yeah, this is one of those books that you really, that it just so much, so beautiful in language and descriptions and the, uh, you know, the crafted sentences that you will always discover something else. But also at the same time, I think that now I see more the universal character of the novel. I can see that this, this applies to a lot of things, a lot of the, the whole world, that we can find the same sentiments and conflicts all over the world, right? Who, you know, just look at how we are living today. And that could be just like a story for um, magical realism in the future to see how, you know, we're living with this COVID, with this pandemic. Well put. Anyone else with a question for Luz? Or reaction, if you have read the book, I would like to, uh, you know, I'd like to hear what is your American perspective. But if you haven't, that's fine. If you, you know, go and read it. Okay, Helen. Luz, uh, do you teach this book in any of your classes? I haven't because, you know, no, I haven't had that opportunity. Is it, is it a different book in the different languages? Have you read it in Spanish as well as in English? 
The, I have read it in English a little bit, but to me, it doesn't have the same flavor as in Spanish. But, but you know, the little that I have read, the English translation is very, very good. Okay. It's really an excellent translation. So Thank yeah, you. I recommend. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, Michael, I think that we don't have any more comments. I really All thank right. you. I'm sure the people will- Can I ask you. one more question? Um, I, sorry, I was just talking with a student. I um, read Love in the Time of Cholera, and I was a little put off by what I thought was sexual assault. Is, um, can you comment on that in 100 Years of Solitude, or how do you feel about that? Well, you know, um, I think that we have changed as readers, right? And we are more yeah. critical of all these aspects. And, uh, but generally, you know, it, it, this is not unique to Latin America. Mm -hmm. You know, look at everything that has happened and women are more aware of, uh, you know, like what you say, what is assault. But for, you know, for that time, it hasn't been, you know, it's like, not only in Latin America, but in a, in a lot of societies, you know, that happens. Men just feel like they have a lot of right over women's bodies. So basically, you're kind of you're seeing him as a man of his generation. Oh, definitely. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. He lived to eighty-seven, and also, you know, you when you read that this novel, there is no other characters. I was also looking at that. There is no diversity. Is either men and women, you know? We never see anything that is what we call diversity, inclusion. You know, it was completely one way or the other. Thank you, that, that makes sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading 100 Years of Solitude, so thanks for your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, Luz, uh, thank you so much. I, I think um, thank you. Uh, you know you, you captured a, a, a truly complex piece uh, in in forty minutes, and that's not easy to do. Uh, but it is a rich text that I think uh, we we can all benefit from. So thank you, mm -hmm. uh, and thank all of you for showing up. Um, we will be back in October, so please check October sixth uh, and. Um, and wherever you get your campus news, check us out to see if we're going to be through Zoom or in the collab or some combination thereof. But uh, we want to thank you all for all the support you'd give us over the years with the Great Book Series. I see some people who have presented, and I see some people who are about to present. So uh, please join us as we keep going this semester and next. Thank you, Luz. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and good luck to everybody. Thank you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>